Okay, we're starting, Mom. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, actually. Um, I am Maria Cotera, uh, Associate Professor of Mexican American and Latino Studies at the University of Texas. Um, and uh, I am so delighted to be in conversation with these two people who I admire greatly, um, who have done so much to recover and preserve uh, community history through their archival work. Um, first, I want to introduce uh, Marta Cotera. Uh, uh, confession, she is my mother, um, but I didn't select the panelists, so <laughs> there's no nepotism here, reverse nepotism. Um, but Marta is um, a longtime librarian. She began her librarian work actually as a high school student, trained in El Paso at the El Paso Public Library. Uh, she really grew up in the library. Um, she translated that knowledge when she came here to uh, Austin, Texas, and served in the Texas State Library, where she did incredibly important work in organizing their collections. Um, and throughout her life, I would say we can, you know, she's known as a Chicana feminist, community activist, a writer, an intellectual that is central to the development of Chicana feminism in the United States. Um, her two published books, Diosa y Embra, A History and Heritage of Chicanas in the U.S., 1976, and her other published work, like The Chicana Feminist, were both considered canonical in the development of Chicana feminist studies. But really not a lot is known about her work as um, an archivist. And so that is what she's going to talk to us about today. Um, I'm very interested in her work because I really see um, I see it as, uh, as, as work that sees uh, the archive as a community project, a community resource, not to be enclosed in libraries um, and not to be um, held by only a select few. That knowledge belongs to all of us. And that is what has, nominate, has, has um, animated her, her archival approach. So she worked for many years as an archival consultant and basically a community liaison for the Benson Latin American Collection at the University of Texas. Um, there she helped develop the Mexican American Papers Project and worked for how many years? 30, 40 years there? 35 years. 35, 35 years. Um, and uh, the, what, the ideas and thoughts that she's gonna share with us today are really based on that work. And I should say, before she did that kind of official library or archive work, she built libraries across the Chicano movement. Um, first, El Colegio Jacinto Trevino, which was a radical uh, university um, in Mercedes, Texas, where she helped develop their library and ordered books from all over the Southwest and articles um, for the community to you know, enrich its knowledge of their own history and culture. Later, as the librarian and archivist at Crystal City, Texas, and a Rasunida Party member, she helped develop both the high school library in Crystal City and also the city library in Crystal City, um, bringing radical books, but also things like fotonovelas to the community, right? And also conducting oral history projects. And, you know, so really trying to make the library a, um, a community information hub right, where the community could uh, preserve its own history and also share that history with others and, and develop things like Chicano studies. So that is really the, the sort of foundational nature of her work. Um, we also have someone who I believe um, follows in the spirit of her information activism, and that is Alan Garcia, mm -hmm. someone who I've long admired and followed on Instagram. Um, Alan has been working, oh, I can read his bio. I actually have a a formal bio. So Alan Garcia is a community archivist and a lifelong Austinite. In 2016, he founded the ATX Barrio Archive, a community archiving project via Instagram, celebrating the culture and history of Austin's black and brown neighborhoods. The ATX Barrio Archive has been exhibited at the Fusebox Festival and Lone Star Zine Fest and published in Remezcla, Zora, Color Lines, and Texas Monthly. In 2020, the Texas Digital Library recognized Garcia with a Student Excellence Award for his community archiving work in response to the ongoing gentrification of historic East Austin. He currently works for the Carver Museum and Oakwood Cemetery Chapel, both operated by the City of Austin Museums and Cultural Program Divisions. And both are really fascinating.
I are don't all... see her anymore. I can't hear her either. So I oh. assume. Oh, are we having difficulties? Technical difficulties? Um, well, I'll wait for uh, for uh, Jesus to tell us if, if we're live. Are we good? Well, anyway, I'll finish my introduction just in case, and then I can repeat it. Um, so yeah, Alan Garcia's work has been really instrumental in good? preserving the history of black and brown well, Austin. Are we good? <laughs> I think I am like a, a bad omen for this particular digital platform. I feel like I'm the one constant in both uh, technical difficulties. Um, mm -hmm. Are we? <laughs> Are we on, Jesus? Did we lose, Jesus? Hello, my name is Miss Elaine, and I'm an arts instructor at the Emma S. Barrientos Mexican American Cultural Center in Austin, Texas. Today, we will be learning about creative writing and the use of literary devices while reading excerpts from the novel The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. In The House on Mango Street, Sandra Cisneros provides the reader with over 45 stories in the form of vignettes or a condensed short story that focuses on one person through the eyes of the main character, Esperanza. Originally from Chicago, Sandra Cisneros is best known for The House on Mango Street, but has since written multiple novels and other literary works. Today, Sandra Cisneros currently resides in San Antonio, Texas. I suggest you take notes on a separate piece of paper, or you can buy a copy of The House on Mango Street from your local bookstore. Creative writing is when an author or writer writes a story, often fictional, in an artistic way with the use of literary devices. A literary device is a tool used by a writer to add meaning to a story or to make a story more interesting with specific word choices. Some examples that we will be using today include simile, imagery, onomatopoeia, personification, and alliteration. Let's begin. In the vignette entitled Hairs, Cisneros uses the literary device known as simile to compare two things using the words like or as. For example, my papa's hair is like a broom, all up in the air. Or, Kiki has hair like fur. Further, my mother's hair like little rosettes, like little candy circles. By using the word like, Cisneros compares the different styles of hair of each of her family members to various items, such as a broom or candy circles. For more information on literary devices and creative writing, as well as a full-length video for this lesson, please visit the ESB Mac website for more information. La Mujer is an annual celebration commemorating prominent Latina women such as Juana de la Cruz, Emma Barrientos, and Sandra Cisneros. But there are many other accomplished Latina women from a wide variety of careers and professions, such as human rights activists, astronauts, U.S. Supreme Court justices, artists, and presidents. These and many other Latina women have paved the way for young Latina girls to be able to pursue their dreams, whatever career field that may be. Thank you for joining us here. Who will be um, talking about her approach to, to archives and the importance of archives for the Mexican American, Chicanx, and Latinx community. Okay, so um, I, I was permitted to actually uh, go over a paper that I was invited to do for the Benson Latin American Collection, a distinct honor considering that there were a lot of political issues involved with, with my, you know, my approach to archiving, uh, bringing uh, work from the community. But in, in 2013, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Zamora uh, it, and, and the committee invited me to make a presentation on uh, the Benson's role uh, as um, having uh, the Mexican-American life project that, that we put in there. We started during the civil rights movement and the Benson's role in, um, in uh, actually in the movement. Uh, so, so I'm gonna uh, read parts of that, uh, that paper that I presented then. Uh, and this has to do with, um, first the definition of archives as, as understood by the activist archivist librarian, uh, defined as the intersection of history, memory, uh, and political power, and um, also rep representing, of course, authority, veneration, places of knowledge, memory, and nourishment. And I think a lot 
is very, very important. Above all, archives have been described as the battleground of contesting ideologies and values. And, and you can't have that uh, tension or, or even that development if you don't have archives. You know, so in, in Mexican jargon, we would call that archives are tumba burros, you know, uh, because archives are disruptive. You know, they are, they are the source of, of power and information. And where if a burro wants to say something, but you can prove it with a record, you know, then that burro has to, you know, has to burros, you know, he has to give way. Um, in the, um, uh, I love Derrida, and I, I wish it had been a, a Latino that, that did this, all that beautiful work on archive fever, because I think Alan, Alan, Maria, and, and definitely understand what archive fever is all about. Uh, and, and that is um, when you acknowledge that archives, you feel it, um, archives being the temple of reverence, authority, and privilege. Uh, and, and he has said it very well, and we all know it and feel it in our bones. Without archives, there is no political power. You know, and to me, you know, the absence of archives means the, the absence uh, and the death of a culture, you know, as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, if you don't have archives, uh, you are uh, living in a vacuum with regards to knowledge and power. And so I'd like to talk about um, in this particular uh, approach that I had to, to discuss with the founding of the um, of the Mexican Library Project and its relationship with the Benson Latin American Collection as a whole, um, I'd like to bring uh, the Chicano movement into it because early on in the 1960s, uh, Chicano movement, like other movements before, you know, we've had other movements in the 1860s, 1880s, 90s, uh, 1920s and 30s. Movement leaders also recognize that that um, as we uh, were participants in the movement, we also had to acknowledge that the movement needed uh, knowledge, that you can't have a movement without knowledge and you can't have knowledge without archives. So we were very much uh, multitasking in the movement, um, working on, uh, we were developing archives because we were doing history, but at the same time, uh, making sure that um, every aspect of the movement kind of had uh, an archival base to it. You know, that archives were acknowledged as being extremely important to the movement from the very beginning. Um, and so from the very beginning, the movement had um, a nativist, uh, uh, I mean, a Native American component to it because that, that required our acknowledging that what we had to recover as, as natives of this continent was the archive of everything, so to speak, that we had to acknowledge that uh, nobody could take away uh, las, you know, our archival heritage. Nobody could take away Las Piedras de Hueco tax, you know, uh, the rock art uh, that represented our indigenous community. Uh, and that like that rock art, uh, we had to acknowledge everything that we had from our past, the codices, and and that we had to acknowledge as hard as it was, of course, our our, our Spanish uh, Spanish heritage, yeah, own it, acknowledge it, and build on it. And so, of course, you know, uh, all of this was extremely important, uh, and and we could not develop movement uh, materials without developing, without knowledge of our history. And so uh, for us, you know, it was very, very important in the movement that uh, we couldn't even actually develop flyers without knowing our history. And so um, what I'd like to say, um, you know, what I would like to add here is that um, in street politics, uh, programs like the Mexican American Library Program uh, were were very important to developing the movement, uh, and there were, 
you know, as, as we develop an awareness of the need for archives within the movement, um, I noticed that there were several um, aspects of it, you know, that, that there were several layers of it within the movement. The Chicano Studies, uh, the Chicano Studies movement, for example, required that we have archives at the university level. You know, and so that's when uh, we in Texas approached uh, the University of Texas to develop the Mexican American Library Project. And so that, you know, as CIMAS developed, the Center for Mexican American Studies, you know, those of us very interested in the archives, you know, also developed a strategy for bringing uh, archives into the university. And it became a political issue because others at UCLA, for example, uh, uh, established a unique archive, a uh, separate from Latin American studies. At Stanford, it became part of the Bancroft and other uh, institutions. At UT, uh, we decided that it should be with the Benson Latin American collection. That became uh, almost a, a stronger political issue than establishing CMAS was a political issue by the way, because everybody was saying, well, why do you want to do an archive at a Latin American collection? But those of, you, of us that knew the history of the Latin American collection and what was in there, you know, could justify it very well by saying, you know, first of all, uh, the Latin American collection was developed by activists. You know, it was developed by Dr. Lisa Cassis, the first full Spanish the first full professor, uh, female professor at the University of Texas, a Dominicana, who who started the the initial, you know, focus on Latin American collecting Latin American materials. Then it it, it went on to Dr. Castañeda, who promoted it, Dr. Américo Paredes, um, uh, Dr. George Sanchez, all of our uh, bright stars that were activists and also. Um, historians and academics had promoted this. And so we decided that this would be the place because the basis uh, for for the cultura and the archives was already there. You know, we had there, we had the codices, uh, we had the sixth letter of relación of, of um, Hernán Cortés, we had Indian codices. Uh, in other words, it was the perfect place for us to be. Uh, Dr. Benson had uh, allowed me to put in orphan collections there in the late 60s, the Fleck Library collections, which were bilingual um, materials uh, that was being closed down in the education library. She also allowed me to bring in collections from the migrant information clearinghouse I started. And she also allowed me to bring in collections from the Dissemination Center for Bilingual Education. So we had a base there. And it was always supposed to be a Latinx archive, not just Chicano archive. And so one of the first collections we brought in um, was a bilingual uh, library from Florida that had been established for Cuban Americans in the 1890s. And so um, anyway, so, so that became the focus, but I wanted to, for the Chicano studies part of the archive movement, in, within the Chicano movement. In addition to that, the Chicano movement also had the library reform activism part of it. And through that activism, we established um, Reforma, which is still you know, a wonderful organization promoting library and archival services you know, for Hispanics throughout the, um, you know, the nation. Um, and then we also had the Chicano educational reform activism movement that promoted, you know, bilingual education and that required, you know, our setting up an archival base for bilingual education. And that got a little bit separated and through Academia probably locally, we're trying to reintegrate again archives as part of the uh, movement to develop bilingual materials. So the education reform movement, very important uh, for archives. Also, the Chicano Press Association was another very important movement for us to accumulate archives because um, these were very limited runs and some of these very limited runs then became primary materials 
that were incorporated in the lucky collections because I tell you, and Alan will probably agree with me that a lot of these materials, you know, I was able to collect a lot for the uh, university because I was, you know, uh, within the, the university system at the Benson Library, but uh, very few libraries were lucky enough to collect these Well, I think we lost Maria and Marta. I uh, don't see them or hear them anymore, unfortunately. Hello, my name is Miss Elaine, and I'm an arts instructor at the Emma S. Barrientos Mexican American Cultural Center in Austin, Texas. Today, we will be learning about creative writing and the use of literary devices while reading excerpts from the novel The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. In The House on Mango Street, Sandra Cisneros provides the reader with over 45 stories in the form of vignettes or a condensed short story that focuses on one person through the eyes of the main character, Esperanza. Originally from Chicago, Sandra Cisneros is best known for The House on Mango Street, but has since written multiple novels and other literary works. Today, Sandra Cisneros currently resides in San Antonio, Texas. I suggest you take notes on a separate piece of paper, or you can buy a copy of The House on Mango Street from your local bookstore. Creative writing is when an author or writer writes a story, often fictional, in an artistic way with the use of literary devices. A literary device is a tool used by a writer to add meaning to a story or to make a story more interesting with specific word choices. And so she invited me to do a history lecture in 2012 where using archives, I was able to show that Ignacio Zaragoza, Adrián Vela, and many martyrs from Texas, Tejanos, who went to fight in Mexico for uh, against the French, so the French would not come into Texas and help the slave communities, you know, the slaveholder communities take hold of the Southwest and then expand slavery into Mexico, that that was a whole, you know, important political moment, but only archives, you know, could show that Cinco de Mayo is not all about folklore and borracheras, that it's a real significant historical event. And so again, folklore into history, and uh, just to, to, um, to, to tell you something about the cultural arts movement, the cultural arts movement everywhere, but especially in Austin, produced a lot of the archives, a lot of archives that are very important. We developed Mexicarte, we developed La Peña and the Mexican American Cultural Center. Um, but before we developed these institutions, there was a cultural arts movement. And again, archives are important because without the archives that the families provided to us, we would not have known uh, what the pastorelas were all about in Austin and how a pastorela could be, you know, reenacted in Austin. So for the cultural arts, having archives and having those family, you know, uh, pastorela songbooks and everything, we would not have had legitimate, you know, authentic, traditional uh, folk dancing and pastorelas. And of course, the feminist movement, you know, uh, Chicana feminist movement, uh, tremendously reliant to develop a movement ideology, va values, um, you know, we couldn't have done it without, you know, the papers that women before us, you know, had the writings that they did, you know, the activities that they did in Austin. And so uh, feminist history would not be feminist history without the archive. So overall, the impact of the um, of archives on the movement was amazing. And I am just so proud that, that we had a movement that was multi-generational, 
that we had a movement and have had a movement that is, um, you know, very gender driven, where we were able to clarify gender values, uh, that we had a movement that incorporated the LGBTQ community so we could uh, bring that. But I don't think this movement would have been as rich as it was uh, if we had not had uh, a lot of academicians and educators and grassroots people that valued community history and that valued uh, using community history, whatever we had, getting it together and using it to do, you know, all our education in the movement, consciousness racing, to do folletos, to do historic models, you know, to address union issues. And so altogether, you know, I think that, um, I mean, you know, I'd like to say that archivists, should I say it? Archivists, you know, make the movement. Um, I think, I think, you know, and, uh, but the, um, the interesting thing is that just as a final thought here, um, I'm, it's hard to say this, but now, finally, after 1986 or so, uh, activist and advocate archivists like myself and like Ellen uh, began to be respected uh, in the profession. And I've, I've attended a few uh, meetings of the Archivist Association and the advocate, activist, archivist, you know, we all get together and, and just kind of cry uh, because it's taken so long for the, for the uh, arch professional archivist community to understand that you cannot do archives behind a desk, you know, and that there's a cycle you know, that activists, archivists are close to the action and therefore they can collect materials as they're being produced by the action, but then they're also close to the producers of the archives so they are trusted and so the archives can go into the archival collections because these activists are right there and they are trusted, you know, and, and they are also, again, close to the donors and also they know the best ways of attracting the users. And again, they are trusted resources by the potential users of the archives. And so it's a, it's a really, it's a beautiful cycle. And um, I no doubt that there are amazing archivists sitting behind the desk, but if I ever meet one, you know, I will identify him or her to you. I have not met one yet. Thank you so much for that. I think there's so many resonances that you brought out with um, Alan's work. And so I do want to give Alan an opportunity to, you know, reflect on, on what you said and, and his own work. And, and, you know, I do think that Alan is one of these activists, archivists in the community. But I also know he's had official archival training uh, yeah. as well, right? Yeah. As, um, so I, Alan, um, uh, please uh, share your thoughts with us. Yeah, no, thank you again for having me this evening to talk about uh, Marta, as you said, this beautiful cycle, uh, this beautiful work that we do as activists, but then people in the community, right? Um, in my case, in the barrio, uh, either in person or virtually connecting with, with folks from the neighborhoods. Um, it's been, you know, since I started this in 2016, it's been a journey. I really didn't expect um, a lot of press coverage. I didn't expect people outside of Austin to care, to know about it. I was really surprised by the response uh, because I just assumed it would be for folks in the barrio, just for us. Um, maybe I internalized a lot of things and I assumed that the press attention would not be there. Um, for the Barrio Archive, but but it's been a it's been amazing to be able to connect with folks. Um, in relation to the Benson, it's been amazing sharing items from from the collection, including some of the items from from Marta that, that you had donated. Um, items related to East Austin, and what I hear from a lot of folks is that they had no idea that UT had preserved pieces of their family history. You know. 
Uh, I've had some really emotional moments just on Instagram and via email with folks who are thanking me for sharing a piece of their family's history because uh, it's a relative that they never met in life, but they only grew up knowing through photographs. And through the archive, they were able to connect with a video uh, of Roy Velasquez that you shot, Marta, yeah. yeah, the interview about Roy's taxi, um, the interview with Rudy Castañón from El Porvenir, just bringing back all these memories for folks. Um, so there's just so, so many connections that, that I've made uh, through the archive. And and yeah, I, I could go on and on, but Maria, I'll I'll pass it over to you to see what, what questions you, you have for me. Well, we, we do have a question from the audience and it's from Elizabeth Pedrosa. And she says, how do you compile archival information and documents? This is a kind of a big question. And I, I, I wanna like use it to pivot to on the distinct practices of uh, our, our traditional archivists, like mom said, the, the ones that sit behind the desk, right? Mm -hmm. And how they approach archives. And then how you two approach archives, because I know it's a very different, uh, the way you might compile, um, Alan, your, your archival objects and uh, process them is quite different than how a traditional archive might might do so. So why don't you tell us about your practice, and then I'll let uh, and then Marta can jump in um, uh, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little different um, not being behind the desk with my project because you know people are sharing items with me in the form of just emails or direct messages on social media. Um, so it is less formal, uh, but that's pretty comfortable for folks, which I enjoy that process that, you know, there is no intimidating desk. Uh, there is no, you know, academic space that can feel inaccessible and unwelcoming for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. Um, but then at the same time, yeah, it's, you know, how do you structure it? Like, at least for the Barrio Archive, there's things that people share with me that's distinctly East Austin, right? Distinctly like East Cesar Chavez neighborhood. So it's celebrating their family history uh, and they grew up on Willow Street or, you know, they grew up off of Chicon. But, um, you know, the Barrio Archive is, is not exclusively East Austin. It's about different barrios. So mm -hmm. yeah, I have to sort of organize things and shout out neighborhoods in the North side, right? Uh, people tend to forget that there's a big presence in South Austin, too. Mm -hmm. uh, the neighborhoods along South First and South Congress back in the day that was a thriving community, right? Mexicanos, immigrants, African-Americans. Um, so that's something I think about, just curating, right? Images, uh, documents, materials that go into the, the Barrio Archive. Mm -hmm. And I just think about people, too. You know, for example, someone was telling me via email, they had a collection of lowrider magazines that they were getting. Wow. <laughs> um, and, you know, for some people, maybe they can focus on the, you know, collectible side of it, maybe the profitable side of it. But to me, instantly, I thought this man has an archive, you know, this, this mm -hmm. own personal archive of Chicano fashion, right? Chicano life. Um, Mm -hmm. these magazines and just wondering how this person he was from from east austin wondering how he curated this selection of magazines right uh what was significant about them maybe he chose the ones that were specific to texas um styles and stuff uh it makes me think too of my interactions with people at the flea market la pulga uh, my family has some personal connections with uh the flea market off 290 and and I don't know, I, I think of these merchants that, that sell, um, one family in particular that ran a video store, Acapulco Video, mm -hmm. they still have a lot of their old merchandise from these stores, you know, audio cassettes and CDs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, that's an archive, you know, I just think of that mm -hmm. as a collection. Um, I would organize that, I would compile that into just an archive of mm -hmm. folks, their, their musical tastes back in the day, right? In the 80s, what, um, what the immigrant community was was purchasing and listening to back then. So that's something that um, I guess through my eyes, I, I see is, is worthy of, of collecting, right? Uh, 
and including in an archive. Mm -hmm. um, Martha, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well. Well, when you when you say that, that just that just makes me extremely anxious and concerned that first of all that we don't have enough resources available uh at the austin public library for example austin history center we only have one person and that one person is supposed to do it all uh the benson collection is uh personnel at the mail they're very 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 limited in imagination and ganas and perhaps even resources because uh, I think Maria has come across this a lot um, in academia that we just don't seem to have the resources that our community needs to to uh, put all these treasures uh, away and you know catalog them, preserve them, and and make them available. Uh, to the future, and so they're being lost every day. You know, when you talk about that, now, um, Marcelo Tafoya had an 18-wheeler full mm -hmm. of Tejano music that he lost. You know, he, he doesn't know who took it or where it went, and, and these are things that are probably treasures not ever recoverable, and we lose a lot uh, in the process because Nobody else, I assure you, in, in Mexico is, is collecting the music that uh, Acapulco and the videos that Acapulco Video has. Mm -hmm. And so if, if they're here, if anybody would have the resources, it's us. And I think that, um, that a, a future project or, or present project for, for youth today would be to develop a foundation uh, funding you know, from people that are willing to donate to for cultural preservation to efforts like this. I mean, this would be, I, I know, I do want to pass it on to Maria because Maria has encountered this and, and I failed to mention and, and, um, and she should mention the digital uh, projects that are going on today, you know, because she comes across this every day and, and it's painful to to know that we don't have the resources to house these treasures and that and that they're just going to disappear and i thought that by this time in my life that we would have the resources but we just don't have seem to have the financial resources to put into saving what i consider our very lives I mean, uh, you know, to speak directly to the question of how you, you know, uh, manage archives, and this is, oh, I think, God. both both touched on this, and that is, you know, typically an archivist might go into someone's home who they deem important or their institution deems important, which is rarely black and brown people, and they would collect the materials that they deem important. Again, a lot of stuff gets mm -hmm. put to the side as unimportant, like those lowrider magazines, right? Mm -hmm. That would not be considered archivally important or historical in significance. And they will take what they deem important, they will organize it or mm -hmm. sometimes reorganize it. Like someone has a bunch of file folders, they might say, oh, this goes with this or this goes with that. Just like what Alan was saying, like how you philosophically conceptualize of what goes with what, right? What, how you curate it, that is also an ideology, mm -hmm. right? And so how you're curating, if you're not, if what my mom was saying, like if you're coming out of the, outside of the community, or you don't have the knowledge that Alan or Martha, or I might have, and you might say this is insignificant, mm -hmm. or this goes with this when it doesn't, you don't have the background knowledge of the community or the history. After you do that, you usually uh, make a list of everything that's there. You put it in the library. Then only scholars usually can come and use it and make history out of it. So a scholar might say, I'm interested in this organization. And then the archivist would say, okay, let me pull this box for you. In the meantime, those scholars, right? Authorized scholars have to leave their laptops at the door, leave their license at the front desk. It's a very, um, yeah constricted and restricted environment. And mm -hmm. so, you know, um, in my own project, Chicana por mi raza, which is an archive of Chicana feminism from the 60s and 70s, you know, we actually take a very different approach. 
We do oral histories with women, figure out what they, how they contextualize their archival collections. We scan the collections and leave them in their homes. We then um, catalog the connect collections on a, online and consult with the women to see what needs to be tagged with this organization or what year this was or who is this individual. And so the process for us, and I think for everyone here on this panel, right, the process is the same. It relies on community knowledge and connections to make sense of what you're seeing and to actually be able to see its historical importance. And then also allowing the community, you know, to, to mark, to be the experts and to say, you know, this is the tag that should go on that, you know, and, and, and so I think there's all these archival processes that we have all, you know, Alan, I think you went to information school, right? So you know the, mm -hmm. the ways, and my mom too, as of many years as an archivist, you know, but those systems of organizing don't always match with our community epistemologies or ways of knowing. And so um, I think that, you know, the, the short answer is like, what is the process? You know, for us, it's like guided by um, that knowledge, right, of the community. Um, and so that's why, and I, I, I'd also like to, you know, mom talked a little bit about uh, the future. Like, what is the future and how do we, do we need a big foundation or an institution to recognize us or collect us or fund us? And Alan has presented a model that's very similar to Chicana por mi raza in that mm -hmm. it is digital. And so it is very um, kind of moving in the future. I like to call it Rasquachi archivist kind of strategies. Like that's how we define ourselves. We're like Rasquachi ar archivists. But I think, you know, we have always been a resourceful people and we take what is there for us. For Alan, it was this amazing platform of Instagram and we document in that way. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, Alan, too, on, on, on this uh, digital aspect. and maybe your worries too about it um in terms of permanence and all of that yeah you know um for the barrio archive in the beginning what i was noticing is just the digital presence of east austin history barrio history was very limited you know for uh, a lot of stories about east austin the narrative began in 2009 when <laughs> the when the new businesses moved in right uh -huh. uh, but no mention of the small business legacy that was there before, right? No mention of El Porvenir, no mention of just people that that uh, built up that that community. So, so that's what I wanted it to be, is just to, there to be a digital presence for Barrio History in Austin for people just to, you know, wherever they are, just access it, learn a little bit, uh, enjoy a little bit of, of the history uh, partake in the celebration of, of our culture, right? And for Austin specifically, I mean, you know, a lot of people have been pushed out. Uh, a lot of people have moved away. Mm -hmm. So the idea that I would expect folks to to visit a physical space, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and oftentimes these institutions aren't located in our community. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just, didn't seem sustainable to expect folks to visit uh, West Austin to learn about their history, right? Visit downtown to learn about their history because many folks are no longer with us. Um, and I just thought that was the easiest way to connect with the, the displacement, right? To acknowledge that folks may not live here anymore, but that they can still connect uh, via social media. And that's been great just because people really identify with the page folks that i've never met before reach out uh from outside of the state right and and want to share their family history with the page but yeah i worry about just the future of of social media and how difficult it will be to archive not just the images that are getting shared but you know people's comments right people interact in different ways online just they, they share it they add their own commentary and in, in the way that they share it and i also acknowledge that not everyone not all of the elders that uh i'm trying to reach are on social media you know mm -hmm. i would love to get involved in publishing somehow because that's mm -hmm. that's a little more permanent you know that's a little more it's funny but yeah that's it's a little more uh sustainable in the future than than what we have on our phones you know that that is kind of precarious when you think about it so 
I, I do wonder about a, a, the best way to just preserve the whole interaction from the Barrio archive um, without having folks, you know, without needing people to sign up just for an account. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm still researching just what the future could be, um, especially too, because a lot of these businesses that are displaced had a small digital presence. You know, there were people sharing photos of their favorite restaurant via Facebook and other social media sites. And those businesses are either demolished or, you know, there's a different site, there's a different business uh, at that site. But the, the digital presence is still there. Um, I'm just wondering what can be done with that? You know, what, how can we, how can we preserve people's, uh, people's comments and, and just the presence of, of these barrio spaces? Yeah, really interesting. <laughs> Sounds like an NEH grant in the making. We should yes. talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would love to hear Martha's thought because she has spanned this um, kind of uh, long history of archival practice from the early days where she was literally, you know, when I when I say she built libraries, I mean, when she went to Juarez, uh, Jacinto Trevino, you know, this radical college in a, in a little school, in a little, uh, an old Victorian house, you know, and built a library there, that really involved writing to different, you know, the Chicano Press Association to to uh, investigating what people were writing and how they were producing it and requesting actual copies and and getting them there. That's so different than, you know, for example, a digital archive that's facilitated by, you know, people just uh, sending you by email, you know, a, a, a scan of something or a photograph. So Martha, what do you think about the digital future of archives and projects like the Instagram, um, the ATX Barrio Archive, and and there's another one, uh, Veteranas y Rucas, that has also gotten a lot of attention um, on a, another Instagram project that's documenting Chola life in uh, in LA primarily, but all over really. Um, and you know, as a traditionally trained archivist, how do you see this? Uh, the precarity maybe of this digital, this new digital world for archives. Uh, well, first of all, uh, they're still, you know, the, di it, the digital archives, they, they are still based on tangible, you know, real life um, items that, that you have to touch, uh, you know, and the, the research that goes into them and uh, what is developed digitally uh, still has a tangible footprint, you know. Todavía tiene papelitos o tiene libritos o tiene... Uh, a, a film uh, or photographs that have been, you know, produced. So I don't think that that will ever go away, that people will always have things uh, that need to be documented, you know, and then presented in different formats, in this case, digitally. But what concerns me is the same thing that concerns Ellen and, uh, and I, I guess yourself too, is once it gets into that digital format, which is another footprint for it, you know, how do we preserve that? Because that's that's another, you know, layer. Uh, and, and so how do we preserve that? Because that has its own additional value. You know, what, what uh, Ellen is saying is, is really beautiful because a lot of times I get comments and, and then they're in emails and they're in Facebook and whatever. And it just, I get anguished because I know that that is very ephemeral and that they're going to go away and, and it's hard to let go. So again, the, you know, I'm not worried about tangible archives always being produced. Uh, I am worried about whether their value is going to become less and less and less as people rely more and more and more on the digital format of it, you know, and then, you know, what happens when that goes away? You know, when the, I mean, how are we going to preserve that? Uh, or are we all just, you know, bound for a future where, you know, like one young activist told me in a panel this week, I don't stand on anybody's shoulders. And so maybe there will be a day in which people are so divorced from the source that they don't need to worry about 
what came before them, because basically that attitude is precisely that. So are we going to be, are we going to lose so much of the context and content that, you know, we're just going to be digital beings? I don't know. It's very interesting. And, and fortunately, I think it's, it's more for Alan to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, yeah. Ellen will have to solve it, I think, at this point, and Penelope and, you know, a lot of teens. What do you think? I mean, Ellen's not a teen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, he's not, not but, you know, he's like, yeah, I wish I had a mustache so I could hide. My, no. You mentioned Ellen. things. Uh, you mentioned that we, we will still have things. I wanted to point out, I still have the Hispanic directory oh. <laughs> that you shared with me. Uh, from 91 um that is maria's masterpiece actually so it's so beautiful. this is interesting this is a convergence yeah. of archive stories because <laughs> i met alan i had been a fan of alan's for a really long time and i came to austin actually to interview it's a strange story but on mm. our website chicana por mi raza we had a photo of an unidentified brown beret woman on the capitol steps mm. and my old friend abel salas who's an old austinite from way back you know, said, hey, that's my sister, my Joanne sister. Salas. And I was like, really, can we interview her? And he put me in touch with her. And so Chicana Por Miglesa, we're, we were here in Austin and we interviewed Joanne and she had an incredible collection mm -hmm. of um, like work that she had done with the Brown Berets, including, mm -hmm. uh, you know, several newspapers, uh, Brown Beret newspapers and an amazing zine that they did around gentrification of the Rainy Street area mm -hmm. back in 1975. And so, wow. uh, or 78. And so then I asked, I reached out to Alan because I, I was kind of a fangirl of his work and he agreed to come and help us scan and, and do all this work. And, and while he was here, he picked up his own archive, the Austin Hispanic director. Yeah. Yeah, right. I love this thing. It was the year I was born. Uh, there's so many great photos. Y'all mentioned a graffiti artist, uh, Alfredo Martinez. Uh, scam. Scam, yeah. That photo yeah, is so yeah. beautiful. Just yeah. no, his, his artwork is still in East Austin. Mm -hmm. His friends, right, are still painting, still preserving some of those works. Um, yeah, I just love, love this. Well, he was, um, he was actually working. He was going to do our next cover. And, and um, yes, and... Um, and it was just very tragic for us, you know, to lose him. Uh, I was a big fan of his work and, and we just loved him so much. He, he was a treasure, um, you know, for all of us. We had, my husband and I then had an office on 7th and Waller Street, mm -hmm. you know. And so we were very familiar with all the wonderful resources in the neighborhood. We had been there. We would had an office there for... 35 years and so we were close to all the business all the business people and of course as founders of the chamber as you were talking you know um and and you gave me an idea for archiving businesses if, if all of us were to turn in photographs for example i have a photograph of myself signing books signing my diosa yembra at la tapatia restaurant Oh wow! It's long That's, gone, and so yeah. I have an interior photo. You know, and maybe Alan, that is a, a. You know what? We have to be optimists. I mean, we are <laughs> going to have the resources going forward. You know, and uh, and I envision if we do a, a museum like the Palm School Museum that that we're promoting, mm -hmm. that that will be a museum for material culture, mm -hmm. and that those resources will give us the opportunity to have off-site, perhaps an off-site uh, collection depository so that not everything, you know, will be lost. And there will be digital archivists in the future that could come back and digitize a lot of items. What worries me a great deal, and there's a museum in Turkey, I'm a big fan of, of, of that museum, uh, where um, the, the, the person that developed the museum was very concerned about losing uh, the neighborhood. And so what he did is he collected items by family and actually put them in cases. And it seems like, you know, that might be an approach if we can get people to, to preserve items 
and then to let them be in safekeeping. So uh, I think the, the Palm School uh, Museum, and we have a friendlier county judge now uh, that, that we can approach. I think that's a very possible, uh, a great possibility. And that will give us a chance to have an offshoot, perhaps an offsite depository, you know, mm -hmm. for uh, local archives at least. So I'll uh, let um, Alan have the last word as we sign off. I mean, it's right at seven, but we had a few glitches. So would you like to uh, give us some uh, closing uh, hopeful remarks? <laughs> hopeful. Um, yeah, you know, I agree that we were united, right? Our community right now, even in the face of all this displacement, uh, all this gentrification and change, uh, things feel different. I will say things have really felt different. The response from city council, uh, other leaders, uh, and just what's happening on the east side, right? Just the show of support. Uh, if you go there on Sundays, right? If you go there tomorrow, Chicano Park, and just see the energy, right? I feel the energy. Um, mm -hmm. It makes me hopeful for these projects we're talking about. Uh, makes me hopeful for, for the work that we're going to do in preserving our history, uh, our culture, and I just want to say thank you all for inviting me this evening. It's been a lovely chat. Um, and I've been just, yeah, dying to reconnect with you all ever since we we had our digitization <laughs> hanging out at your house pre-pandemic. Um, <laughs> we all get in person soon to, mm -hmm. to do more work. Yes. Thank you all for well, thank you. Thank you. Both. Thank you both for your work. Um, I too look forward to preserving um, this history and you know, it's like in gentrification is a form of violence. I believe strongly that archiving our history is a form of resistance. So yes. I'm so glad that I'm working with you guys. All yes. right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Oh.